Thank you for joining me again for another edition of The Mind of Christ. I subtitled this Challenger Deep because I, uh, the Challenger Deep is the deepest part of the ocean. And I figured I needed a metaphor to identify how deep the mind of Christ is. And so that's why I call this study Challenger Deep. Uh, this was a study I did back in 2010 to 2017, produced 21 journals, and what you're getting in this series is uh, some pretty raw material uh, from that in-depth study that I did over that period of time. Uh, currently, we're in the Sermon on the Mount, and as I was going through this, I realized that there was a section of the Sermon on the Mount that I didn't journal about back in 2010. And so recently, I went back and added that into um, uh, the current journal that I've been producing. And uh, I am happy that uh, we're actually at the end of the 21st journal. And I'm happy to be able to present that uh, to you at this time. Uh, that section was Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 34, a pretty important section. And I want to begin there today. We'll see if we can get through that part, I think. And then uh, hopefully, if we have time, we might get into a little bit more of... Um, the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew chapter 7. So let me read the text to you, and then we'll jump into my commentary on it. Uh, verse 25, Matthew chapter 6, <clears throat> Jesus says, For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life, as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, or nor your, your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
are you not worth much more than they? And when and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubic uh, to your lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that, that even Solomon in all of his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow, is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more uh, do much more for you, O men of little faith? Do not be anxious then, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. All right, let's da dig into that section and see what we can find. <clears throat> Actually, Matthew 6, 25 through 34 connects directly with the preceding verses as Jesus says, for this reason. For this reason. Anytime you see that phrase, for this reason, you know it's connecting with what was said previously. Jesus was talking in the previous section about not being able to serve both God and mammon. Jesus says it is better to lay up treasures in heaven where your heart should be. The reason is the word dia, D-I-A, a preposition meaning through. The ground or the reason by which something is or is not done. It's used many, many times in the New Testament, over 580 times in the New Testament. In the sermon, Jesus only uses dia once more, and that is in chapter 7 and verse 13, about entering through or by or by reason of the narrow gate. The gate, of course, is Jesus. And Jesus, of course, uh, is the reason for entering, is, is the reason why we can enter. We're going to avoid serving mammon and keep our treasures in heaven with our hearts, where our hearts are. We're going to have to listen to what Jesus says about anxiety. So the word worried or anxious is mer em neo. M-E-R-I-M-N-A-O, meaning to be troubled with cares because of proximity uh, to, to one's interest. In other words, the cares are getting a little too close to the interests that we have. The focus is on provision. How can we provide what is needed? Specifically here, the daily necessities of life. It is found six times in Matthew uh, this word anxiety uh, is found five of those times in this specific text. The other one is in Matthew 10 and verse 19, where the apostles were told not to worry about what they would say if they were turned over to the authorities because the Spirit would give them what they needed in that hour. So that's the only other time the word is used in Matthew in Luke 10 and verse 41, Jesus tells Martha that she is worried about so many things as she rushes to get dinner on the table. And in Luke chapter 12 is parallel to Matthew chapter 6. And then in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul speaks about the unmarried who can be free from the concern or the anxiety or the worry of the things of this world, only to be concerned about the things of the Lord. And so even the word, word concern there about the things of the Lord is the word anxiety or the word worry. So we can not worry about the world, but we can worry about the things of the Lord. Again, context uh, helps us to understand how uh, to apply that. So to have a, a single concern for the Lord makes one holy in body and in spirit. Yet 1 Corinthians 12, 25, Paul says that the members of the body are to have the same care for one another or concern for one another or the same worry or anxiety for one another. Uh, again, there's good anxiety and there's bad anxiety, I guess. That's, that's kind of how we have to interpret this. In Philippians 2.20, Paul says of Timothy that no one else 
would have a genuine concern or anxiety or worry for their welfare. But in Philippians 4, 6, Paul tells us that we're to be anxious for nothing. So we're getting mixed views here on anxiety or worry or concern. Uh, and all the translations that I've, I've referred to here are the same word. So the idea is, is, is that there's some unhealthy anxiety and then there are things that we should be concerned about. And sometimes we use that in a, in a kind of a accommodative way. We would say, well, I'm not really worried. I'm just concerned. Well, I think it's not quite that simple to, to say it that way. Uh, there is harmful anxiety and then there is helpful anxiety. Actually, I was uh, corresponded with a, a, a quite well-known uh, psychologist, a psychiatrist, I think he is. Uh, his name was Hans Selye, and he wrote a book called Stress Without Distress. So stress is normal in life. Distress, though, is what will kill you, and we need to know the difference. So let's see what else Jesus says. He says, and perhaps it is a certain type of anxiety. Do not be anxious, he says, for your life. Life here is suke. Suke is a human component uh, which can be associated with physical life like the animals. Uh, and it can also be associated with eternal life depending on the context. It can be translated soul. So what is the focus of suke? In this passage as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink nor for your body as to what you shall put on so the the aspect of life or suke that he's concerned about here is is those things that um, concern us on, on a physical level food drink and clothing um, another word is introduced and that is the word body or soma s-o-m-a so suke is associated with body or soma here and with eating and drinking. The focus of the anxiety is food, drink, and clothing. Learning to be content daily in the, in the prayer, uh, it is about give us this day our daily bread like manna to learn to be happily dependent on the Father to supply daily necessities of life. This is the kind of uh, focus of, of the suke is, is when we are um, concerned about the daily necessities of life. That's the way he's using suke in this particular context. So is this a very narrow focus in this text? If that is so, we still have to, we have Philippians 4 that tells us to be anxious for nothing which certainly broadens our array of concerns. Where does Jesus direct our attention? First, he directs it to birds. They are easily observable. Other animals are often rarely seen unless you go look for them, but birds are everywhere. The word he uses there is observe or look. It's emblepo, E-M-B-L-E-P-O. Uh, it means to turn one's eyes or gaze or behold or consider. Jesus wants us to see God's care for the birds. The world is God's aviary, if you will. He has billions of birds in it. He has designed the ecosystem so that the birds have ample food available. They do not have to seek it very in, in a very hard way. There are bugs and seeds readily available. And in other generations, man would live off the land, but as the population grew, and we became urbanized, food availability changed, and we couldn't just pull an orange off of a neighbor's tree. We had to have some money to purchase it at the store, or we had to qualify for a food bank donation. And what about storing food? My freezer and pantry is full. Is that a violation of the intent of Jesus, his teaching here? Is the goal here daily dependence on God, like in the days of manna? Am I thwarting this, this teaching by storing up food for the days ahead? Uh, is, it seems to me that the 40 years of manna was because they did not trust God to give them the, the fields and the vineyards that they did not plant. 
and the fortified cities that they did not build. He tried to give them a self-sustaining system, and they rejected it through unbelief, and they were tested and trained in the desert for 40 years with a daily ration of food. So I'm not sure that manna in the desert was the standard or was the gold standard, at least, of how we were supposed to live our lives because uh, God had offered them a ready-made vineyard, if you will, of, of food in the, in the cities of, of uh, Canaan, but they rejected those things and then God put them on food rations for 40 years. The fact that birds do not sow or reap, at least as humans do, I don't think is meant to say that we should not sow or reap. Jesus talked about both in his ministry. Birds are not people, but they do have a manner of sowing and reaping. Often they eat seeds that do not digest and are eliminated as they fly, dropping the seeds to take root elsewhere and one day produce a harvest. But I think Jesus' point is that the birds do not stress over daily bread. The resources are there, and they just go about their day, and it happens. Probably most important is birds do not gather into barns, but some animals do. I don't think he's condemning sowing, reaping, nor gathering. He wants us to recognize it is God, the Heavenly Father, who feeds them. God is the provider. God sees the needs of his creatures, and he provides. Perhaps heavenly is mentioned because God's gift, gifts come from above. Manna came down. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. James 1.17 When we need food, drink, and clothing, where do we look? Up? Out? Or in? Well, if we look in, we may be counting on ourselves. If we look out, we may be counting on others. And if we look up, we may be counting on the Father. The key to this teaching is that the Father considers man worth more than birds. Worth is diaphreo, D-I-A-P-H-E-R-O. It's used three times in Matthew. It's used in Matthew 10 and verse 31. It says that we are worth more than many sparrows. Well, how many sparrows am I worth? Well, this in the context of the limited commission and how God would take care of the apostles as they were sent out on that journey. And then in Matthew 12 and verse 12, Jesus was showing the Pharisees valued their sheep more than they did sick people. So how much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? Well, Jesus makes these comparisons to help us understand either our value or the value of others. We can only get this by looking through God's eyes. So how do we assess value of a person? In the case of the Pharisees, they valued what was a benefit to them. Do I do that? It is easy to dismiss a person who I think cannot benefit my ministry. Seeing the inherent value of a person is Jesus' point. This is what God does. And out of this point of view, God provides. Galatians 2.6 might be well to study in this regard. I just throw that in. And Philippians 1 and verse 10 urges us to approve of what is excellent or valuable. We must learn to see value and worth where it can be found. Um, and this is one of the challenges of man is, is to know what is valuable and what is not. Jesus turns from provision to addition. Who can add a single hour to his life, he asked. The word here is pichus, P-E-C-H-U-S, meaning really cubic, which was a me measurement from the joint of the elbow to the tip of the middle finger, about 18 inches. No one can lengthen their life. Can we cut it short? Well, perhaps. But can we lengthen it? Well, I suppose that there are some ways to lengthen life with, uh, through modern medicine and, and uh, the uh, ability to sustain life longer than it, we would naturally when this was written. 
but it's used in John 21, 8, and it's also used in Revelation 21 and verse 17, is this measurement, the cubic. So why use a linear measurement to in this context? Hour seems more appropriate, H-O-U-R, hour. But cubic is more visual. The word translated life in 627 is helikia, H-E-L-I-K-I-A, sometimes translated life span or age or time of life, a term or a length of time, but can be translated dature. It lasts in Ephesians 4 and verse 13, where Paul says the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Stature here is the, is the word for lifespan. That it would be another translation. Hebrews 11.11 11 speaks of, the, of Sarah being past age to have a child. In other words, her lifespan had been extended. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 25, the same as in Matthew 6.27, I sometimes think about my lifespan my mother died at age 50. My father died at age 93. The average would be 71.5. For some reason, that seems like what I should expect. My older brother lived to 65, two years younger than I am now. And my next brother is still alive at age 77, 10 years older than I am. So why do I think, on, why do I even think about these numbers? I guess we're all curious, particularly the older we get, as to how long we're actually going to live. I guess we just want to know. I would, um, would I live differently if I did know exactly how long my life would be? And then Jesus turns to clothing. Uh, enduma, E-N-D-U-M-A. John wore a garment of camel hair. Was that the extent of his wardrobe? Matthew chapter 3 and verse 4. In Matthew 22 and verse 12, Jesus mentions wedding clothing. And the false prophets who are wolves in sheep's clothing, Matthew 7, 15. So why is there anxiety over what we will wear? <clears throat> well, because we, we care what others think. From the birds to lilies of the field or the wildflowers, God adorns these small flowers, and when found in great quantity, they can be very stunning in appearance. But we wouldn't dare talk of lilies as worrying about their appearance. God designs them, created them, and gave them the ability to reproduce. Solomon could not compete with the lilies in glory. Today we are impressed with bigger and bigger closets, walk-in, rooms for dozens of shoes, for places to hang up our clothing, and many drawers for clothes for, for all seasons and occasions. And surely Jesus, who wore a seamless garment and the soldiers who gamble for his clothes at the cross didn't need a closet except, perhaps, for a place to pray. The word observe in 628 is, see if I can say it, kata manthano, K-A-T-A-M-A-N-T-H-A-N-O, only found here. To, it means to observe thoroughly, to examine carefully to consider well and this is when we're considering the lilies of the field the name for lilies is anemones a-n-e-m-o-n-e-s uh, israel is covered by these in march and april many a deep fiery red color and associated with the cross uh, today since there are many look-alike flowers here, we have to look closely to see which ones are the lilies. The crown anemone has six petals. In Israel, it is illegal to pick these wildflowers. John Chancellor, in his book, Flowers and Family uh, of the Bible, uh, 1982, says this is likely the poppy anemone, uh, or it could have been a white uh, rayed uh, ch chamomile. I'm, I know I'm butchering these words. C H A M O M I L E. Uh, some believe lilies were merely all wildflowers from various species. Regardless, we are instructed to observe these carefully. 
to be reminded of how God will take care of us. Specifically, the lilies do not toil nor spin. Their beauty is natural. A flower does not have to work at being beautiful. It simply is because of its design. Our clothing is like the petals of a flower, adornment. But the, the true beauty of a person is inward, 1 Peter chapter 3, not outward adornment. Our true selves should come through and be what we are remembered by. Toil here, about lilies not toiling, is copia, K-O-P-I-A-O, to grow tired or exhausted or burdened or wearisome effort. We see none of this with a lily. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus tells those who, who labor um, thus to come to him to find rest for their souls. And so those of us who do labor and spend, we can find rest with Jesus. In Luke 5 and verse 5, where, where Peter toiled all night and caught no, no fish, this is exhausting labor, and lilies do not participate in exhausting labor because there is, uh, the reason it's exhausting is because there's no reward. In John chapter 4 and verse 6, Jesus had this kind of toil, this weary, weariness from his journey, but he revived as he spoke with the woman at the well. The word spin here is netho, N-E-T-H-O. It's only found here and in Luke in the same context. It refers to the spinning of cloth, uh, to make thread, to, to make clothing. It's quite a process, plant-based clothing instead of skins. In, ch in chapter 6 and verse 30, says, God is the one who clothes the grass of the field. Perhaps the flowers in their beauty is the clothing for the grasses, which are more plain and ordinary. God adorns the grass with, with flowers to make them seem more beautiful. What a fitting picture for us. He makes our lives more beautiful, not our clothing. Grass comes and goes, here adorned with flowers one day and burned up another day. Why would God go to the trouble of clothing something that will only be here for a short time? We, we are clothed so that we will not be naked. The first family made fig leaves and God gave them animal skins. Adam and Eve were ashamed. Is grass without flowers shameful? Is it that God does not want us put to shame? Clothing today is abundant. There is always something to cover the body. Some clothing, even, even some of them even has flowers on them. Concerning grass, Peter says, quoting Isaiah 40 and verse 6 and following, All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. Grass withers and the flower falls off. Here his point is, is, is that the Word of God stands forever in contrast. But that's the point. Something even as temporary as grass is given glory. But we are potentially eternal. And surely God would see us more valuable than grass. By the way, seems some folks' flowers has already fallen off. The furnace is Kilbanos, K-I-L-B-A-N-O-S, an earthen vessel for baking, heat, uh, heated either from the inside or from the outside, uh, and so that bread can be uh, baked correspondingly. It is an oven. That's what he's talking about here. Our inability or reluctance to believe that God will provide is given by Jesus the admonition, perhaps, or the rebuke, you of little faith, Perhaps rebuke uh, is, is a good word to use here because we need to be reminded of how weak our faith sometimes is. This idea of little faith is really one, one word. It is oligopistos, O-L-I-G-O-P-I-S-T-O-S, and uh, it means trusting too little. Matthew uses it in chapter 14 and verse 31 as Peter is walking on the water and begins to sink. And he says to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
And then in chapter 16 and verse 18, it's used by Jesus while the disciples discussed among themselves that they had no bread. And he says, you men of little faith. And then in chapter 8 and verse 26, disciples with Jesus uh, in the storm, uh, he is asleep. And when they awake him, he says to them, why are you so timid, you men of little faith? From these, we see two enemies of faith. One is doubt and the other is timidity. They are real and they are relentless. How different life would be if they never entered our heart. But then we would think ourselves foolish. You know, we would be risk takers. So where is the line between the two? Maybe I should memorize this word, oligopistos, and say it when I feel doubt or fear. Maybe I would hear Jesus' words in my ear. Maybe I would be reminded of his promises and assurances. Why is it so hard to believe he loves me and will provide? In Matthew 6 and verse 31 is a summary conclusion in this particular section. Jesus has made his case from nature, lilies and birds. In 632, Jesus will add two more points. First of all, the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things is the first point. What separates us from the Gentiles or the pagans? It is the word ethnos. So when we hear Gentiles, it is the word ethnos, E-T-H-N-O-S. His audience is Jewish, and the Jews are held to a higher standard, see Romans chapter 2, because they have had more advantages to know God and his ways. Gentiles, he says, eagerly seek food, drink, and clothing. So the word that he uses here about eagerly seeking is epizeteo, E-P-I-Z-E-T-E-O. The word is used in Matthew 12 and verse 39. An evil and adulterous generation craves or seeks eagerly for a sign. Also is found in Matthew 16 and verse 4. The cravings of our heart must be considered, kept in check, and balanced with what God says is most important. And then in Hebrews 11, 14, and in 13, 14, uh, the word is also found. The focus is seeking a city or a country in which to live, a heavenly one, just as the Jewish ancestors search for the promised land. The prefix on this word, uh, epizetio, uh, is the prefix is epi, E-P-I. It gives the word intensity. This is no casual search. Whatever is being sought is very important. And so the Gentiles eagerly search for food, clothing, and, and water. So back in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 47, Jesus compares also them to the Gentiles, that the way they greet their own, that even the Gentiles greet their own, we should do more than that. He says, and if you greet your brothers only, do you do more than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? And then in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, Christians, a Christian's righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. This comparison is meant to encourage us as his Christ followers to take our game up a notch or two. We should be more focused, more serious, more committed than the self-righteous Pharisees and the common Gentiles. Our faith is meant to take us higher. The second point in 632 is, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. In our final pursuit of daily necessities, do we stop to realize that our Father knows what we need? What difference does this make? None unless our Father is also good and able to provide, and He is both. The word know here is uh, odin, o i. D-E-N, it means simply uh, to know. The word for need here, God knows what we need, is um, C-H-R-E-Z-O. It means seeking is tied, here he's talking about seeking being tied to the needs that we have. What we think we need is what we seek. This is why we must be very careful to know what we really need. If it is 
a legitimate need, then God already knows that we need it. If it is just a want or even an unholy desire, God knows that we don't need it and that we shouldn't desire it. The question I should have is, what does God know that I need? Then I can adjust my desire and seeking to what he knows I need. What is a human necessity to God? If he were packing my bag for a journey, what would he put into it? What is mere clutter? What is unnecessary? What is excess baggage and weight? And what are the needs I can't put into the bag but are essential for my sojourn? This is where 633 comes in in our text. We are told to seek two things first. So God knows we need these two things. First, the word first is the word protos, P-R-O-T-O-S, as in priority or in prototype. It is interesting in Matthew 19 and verse 30 that Jesus says, but, Mary who, but many who are first will be last and the last first. This is another indication that God looks at first and last differently than we do. We tend to put the wrong things on or the wrong people first. Also in Matthew 20 and verse 27, and whoever wishes to be first among you should be your slave. Priority is a tough lesson to learn. Then in Matthew 22 and verse 38, Jesus says that the greatest and the foremost or the first commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. To miss the first is to miss them all. Often much is rolled up in the first that can't be found in the second or the third. When we settle for the inferior needs, we are often disappointed. It is like drinking a soda when I could have had a V8. But in 633, when we seek the kingdom and the righteousness first, we also get our other needs met, the ones that God knows about. Our seeking the priorities of life does not mean that we forfeit the lesser needs. They are still needed, food, drink, and clothing. But if I seek these first, his kingdom and his righteous may not be thrown in to the gift. This is a very important lesson from Jesus. He's helping us prioritize our lives to get the most out of them. Like in the story of getting rocks and pebbles and sand into the glass jar. They have to go in in order of priority to get them all in the jar. The two priorities are his kingdom and his righteousness. Well, God knows that we need both, but we do not always know it. Kingdom has always been a part of the prayer, has already been a part of the prayer that we've been studying here in Matthew chapter 6. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus also told us that our righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees in order for us to enter the kingdom of heaven. In this, Jesus connects the two needs. One is key to the other. We need kingdom rule in our lives. Without it, we will also go astray. In order to have consistent kingdom rule, we must replace our filthy rag righteousness with the splendid robes of Jesus' righteousness, secured for us on the cross. His righteousness provides entrance into His kingdom. Later, Jesus will tell us much about the nature of this kingdom, what it means to be a part of it. For now, He just wants us to know what a priority it is. Jesus told Nicodemus this in other words. He says, we must be born again or from above to be able to see or to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus makes a promise to those who enter his kingdom and by his righteousness. And that, and that is that all these things, food, drink, and clothing will be added to you. The word add is a word which means to put to or to add. It is the word he uses in 627 about adding a single hour or cubic to one's life. 
Just as we can't add length to our lifespan, neither can we add necessities to our spiritual lives. But Jesus can. How does he do how how he does so is curious. It is not hard to see in some circumstances, but in a land where almost all have their basic needs met, we must not think everyone is putting his kingdom and his righteousness first. If it worked that way, we could easily see who belongs to God and who doesn't. We might conclude a curse has been put on a poor person, even though James says God chose the poor to be rich in faith. Practically, this is a hard scripture to apply. I know more kingdom-driven people who have missed meals than, I, than those who are not so driven. Regardless of our poverty, it is true we need more focus on the kingdom and righteousness. That's all that will matter one day. Well, just a note on his kingdom and his righteousness. It is his. It's not ours. Our rule in Christ is over. It is not my righteousness that counts. These two words preceded by his sums up our dependence on the Father. Without him running our lives and him saving us, our boat is sunk. There would be no hope. Jesus ends with a warning about uh, being anxious or worried about tomorrow. Of course, an experience not promised to us. I need to get that. Tomorrow is not promised to us. Only today. And even if tomorrow were promised, it, would, we would, it will have trouble of its own. Trouble is kakia, K-A-K-I-E. A general word um, dependent on context as to what the meaning is. Um, no specific trouble is mentioned here or what kind of trouble it may be, but it might uh, infer the trouble is lack of food, drink, or clothing. Could be the trouble that we would be in. The Gentiles are said to be filled with trouble. Romans chapter 1 verse 29. 1 Corinthians 14 20 warns us not to be mature in trouble or in evil is another translation, but be infants in regard to those things. The contrast to trouble here is our thinking. It is usually when we stop thinking that we get into trouble. Ephesians 4.31 tells us to put it away from us, trouble or evil, translated malice here, also can be translated evil. 1 Peter 2 verse 16 warns us not to use our freedom as a cover for malice or trouble. Trouble never takes a vacation, and each day has enough trouble of its own. The word enough here is arkitos, A R. K-E-T-O-S. It's used in 1025. That's Matthew. It is enough, he says, for the disciple to be like his teacher and the slave to be like his master. I wonder when some people have had enough trouble, yet they seem to want more, so they borrow it from tomorrow. Peter reminds his readers that they have spent enough time or sufficient time carrying out the desires of the Gentiles, filled with all manner of sin, including sensuality and lust and drunkenness, carousing and drinking parties, and abominable idolatries, the party crowd often dips in tomorrow, into tomorrow's troubles. Keeping our plate clean each day is a better way of living. Clean up the messies as they happen. Don't carry them over to tomorrow. Forgive today. Reconcile today. Enjoy your daily bread today. Pursue peace and, king, and kingdom and righteousness today. And don't worry. And don't worry. Well, I thought I might be able to get to, to more today, but uh, that's going to have to be for tomorrow. And I'm not going to worry about that today. So that's enough because we've, we've, we've explored a very important part of our lives, and that is how do, we, how do we handle the cares and the concerns that we have on a daily basis, and what does Jesus teach us about that? But thank you for joining me for this. Uh, I know this is a very in-depth study. It's one that you would probably do well 
to have your hand on the pause button so that you can jot down scriptures and so that you can think about the different things that I have brought up in these lessons. But until next time, uh, I, I wish you well. And if you want to find uh, some of the previous recordings that we have on this subject as well as others, you can go to centralsarasota.org and you can find all we have right there. So God bless you. Take care. Oh uh -huh.